Good evening guys, just to get your attention, my name is Jonathan and I'll be taking you guys the next 25 minutes. So get you guys just to um, attention over this way, thank you guys, much appreciated. I like to make eye contact with everyone, so if you are short, I uh, will do my best. So guys, uh, welcome to Archie Rose, safety briefing firstly, have you signed your waivers? Yes. Yes, yes. fantastic. Now guys, bear in mind if you do hurt yourself, it's your fault, not mine. Um, if you drown in gin, once again, your fault, not mine. That said, uh, legally, you're all covered anyways, but it's just a, a recommendation you do read those fine points because it is a working distillery, which means we do produce ethanol and alcohol down here. Uh, if you walk through and touch anything, that could potentially hurt you. Uh, so please bear in mind, copper pot stills are running today, so please don't touch mm. the copper. It will leave you a nasty souvenir. Uh, I wouldn't deviate from the path of the tour. Some of the things that we do are quite dangerous. The guys inside do wear steel cap boots. Uh, it's a one day work health and safety uh, induction as well. So guys, please don't deviate from the path of the tour today. If you do so, I am a first aid trainer as well, so please remember I'm here to help, but you're just gonna ruin everyone else's night. So, please don't do it. Uh, I'm gonna give you some alcohol to taste today as well. So obviously you got, you're tasting it here, and you're doing a function upstairs as well. So please be responsible for yourselves. I am here to keep an eye on you guys and serve you alcohol but I can only carry so many people on any night, okay? So, guys, in regards to what we're going to do today, let's check out the working distillery, go through whiskey, gin, and vodka, and how it's produced in Archie Rose. I'll give you as much as I can over the next half an hour, and we'll do a tasting of our spirits as well. In regards to the spirits tasting, it is up to you guys whether you want to opt in or opt out from tasting, or choose whichever spirit you'd like to taste. I'll offer you guys the full tasting of all eight of our products. If you want to go for all eight, by all means, but once again, it is up to you guys, okay? If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, the more questions you guys ask, the more we're going to learn together. Cool? Fantastic, awesome. thank you. I will get you, sir, to lead my friends to the far side of that table. Come in, guys, welcome. Yo, hey, you're, you're first, the security here, but this is still open. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is kind of hilarious, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, you can the regular You guys, come on down a little bit closer, please. Come on down, come on down. <laughs> Alrighty, friends. Uh, so this is current workspace of Archer Rose. Um, Please bear in mind, this is about a 300 square meter facility. We make gin, vodka, and whiskey inside this warehouse. Um, we are growing to be a bigger company as well. So we are building a 3,800 square meter warehouse down the road in Banks Meadow, uh, which will be obviously a lot bigger than this. In regards to space, this is five meters tall in the little trestle. And the other place is 15 meters tall. Uh, it will give us tenfold the volume that we create down here. So the Archivos will be facilitating uh, international needs. Um, these are the eight products that we currently have. So vodka, four types of gin, unaged rye, unaged single malt, and some single malt whiskey. So in regards to, I guess, our brand, uh, is everyone here a Sydney local? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome, great. Uh, so in regards to why Archie Rose and why Sydney, we wanted to build a distillery that's within a, a striking distance of an urban area. If you look back 10 years ago in Sydney, there was no distilleries in New South Wales, essentially. You'd have to travel to Tasmania or Scotland. Uh, and the idea of Archie Rose is to be transparent, innovative, uh, and quite open. So when you guys can come down and visit the distillery, just bear in mind you didn't have to fly to Tasmania or Scotland to visit the distillery, which is quite important to us. Um, Archie Rose as a name, quite important to note. Um, Archibald Primrose was the first person they named Rosemary after. He was a, uh, a, a governor in the UK uh, and a fifth earl of some description of the local area. So when they created Rosemary, they named it Archie Rose, as you see it today. So his name's Archie Primrose. Archibald Primrose. Primrose. Yeah, Archibald oh, Primrose. Sort of he seemed to be quite a boring character from all the textbooks. I don't know why they named Rosemary after him, but he got a big block of land named after him, okay? So, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Archie Rose for us was the best way about it. Though this isn't the only site for Archie Rose, it will be the heart and soul of what we do in terms of research and development moving forward. So guys, we've been operating since December 2014. Um, we made vodka, gin, and unaged whiskey at the very beginning. We used to do everything by hand as well. So I'll walk you through the whiskey making process followed by gin and vodka. So guys, to create whiskey it's quite simple. We'll take 600 kilos of grams, go to the grist mill, and we'll go for the mash tun on the far side here. This is a two year old mash tun. We've been around for four years. So prior to the mash tun being brought in, we actually hand stirred everything. So if you can imagine a vat that's two arm lengths wide, waist high, 
uh, 3,000 liters of water at 75 degrees, 600 kilos of and just stirring it through for 45 minutes. Has anyone actually been to Tasmania and seen a distillery down there? A couple? Great. You'll notice that the, the facilities are very, very small in Tasmania. I'd urge anyone that hasn't been to go check it out. It's really, really enlightening and you know, just really opens your minds about what they're doing down there. But it's such a small scale that the pots that they serve are about this big. So for us to create volume, obviously the idea was to build a bigger facility and bigger volume. And we didn't consider the ergonomics of how hard stirring grains by hands were. So this was brought in two years later. Um, so guys, 600 kilos of grain goes in. The propeller on the top, the propeller on the bottom, will stir the grain with 3,000 liters of water, heating it to about 70 degrees Celsius. About four hours later, we extract the wort. comes out and the sugar is sweet. Uh, and that's the start process of getting the whiskey going. Okay. From that point, guys, the wort gets pulled out at 2,300 liters. goes into our fermenters. We add a yeast in there that starts the uh, fermentation process. After four and a half days, it turns about 5% alcohol content. Now, what you guys would drink down in the bar and in your water source down here at Archer Rose, that water's from Sydney's finest, Moro Gamma Dam. Um, yeah, a little bit muddy. Um, so guys, <laughs> as it gets filtered, we, we pass it through carbon filtration, softening with salt, uh, reverse osmosis, UV lighting, and it gets passed through some tie system as well. So it's uh, demineralized, softer, has no fluoride, and won't contribute to the fermentation. So guys, after four and a half days, 5% alcohol content, tastes like a, a leftover tinny uh, in terms of how sour and yucky it is. Uh, this is a chilling jacket which allows us to cool the jacket. Obviously with fermentation there's a lot of heat that's created. But please bear in mind, Sydney itself is very hot. Um, so if you don't control this, it changes the flavour and aroma of your whiskey later on. Okay. So if you ever wonder when you drink whiskey you get these different notes of flavour, whether it be fruit notes or nuts or caramels or anything like that. Uh, it's all contributed to the actual yeast that's used and the temperature of the environment you create to alternate those flavours and aromas. So it's actually a crucial point. At this point, guys, it's pretty easy. Throw into these pots still. So guys, if you pop around, and I'll get you to swing around this way in a bit of a, a U shape. So guys, you've got two pot stills to emulate a Scottish method. Uh, if you had three pots, you'd be talking Irish method. But you've got the first pot down there, which is the wash still. You guys want to, if you can't see it, so you can pop around if you want to. It's 3,600 litres. When we first opened Archie Rose, it was actually the biggest pot still in Australia from an independent company. Okay? Uh, so that's 3,600, this one's 2,200. Now, if you know what copy costs, um, I believe the first one down there, the biggest one, was valued at over $780,000, which buys you maybe a one bedroom apartment in the city. <laughs> um, so if you're lucky, yeah, yeah, maybe. So guys, in terms of the chemistry, it's pretty simple. Just bear in mind that 5% alcohol content gets pumped into the wash still. And like a kettle pop back home, you're going to turn it on and it's going to boil. The difference is, water boils 100 degrees Celsius, alcohol 78.3. So it doesn't have to get too hot before it starts uh, disappearing. Okay? So please bear in mind when it boils, it actually goes up the swan deck, which is the elongated part going upwards. As it goes up as a vapour, it'll have interaction with the copper lining itself. Now please bear in mind, copper is used in distillation to attract heavy impurities make it safer and better for you guys to consume. So the more copper interaction it has, the lighter the it gets. We'll go down the line arm, being the horizontal part, hitting the condenser on the far side. The condenser is a shell and tube, hits that, recondenses into a liquid. What comes out is 800 liters at 20% ABV. Not safe to drink. Uh, it's called the low wines. It's got this thick sludge of fusel oils on top. If you drunk that, you'd probably get really ill and maybe die. Um, so if you walk past, yeah, walk past you at three o'clock in the afternoon, it smells of sulfur, it stinks like uh, all hell. Um, so I wouldn't recommend you we drink it today. What we see coming out of here is really interesting guys. So after you do the first pot, it's still not safe to drink, so you gotta run it a second time. So this is what we're getting to witness, it's called the heart of the spirit. Please bear in mind, we turn it on, we get the heads first, which is a smaller container. Danger, do not sample. It's got notes that you don't want to find in your whiskey. It smells like a permanent marker shop right up your nose. Um, so it's 78% ABV on average. Four hours later, you get the heart of the spirit. And over that four hour period, you get honey sweet fruit forward notes in the first hour, 78% ABV. Two hours later, spicy and peppery notes start coming through. Fourth and final hour, peak smoke. So it just gets heavier. So guys, this is what you actually keep from whiskey later on. You get about 300 liters of volume. What comes out the back end is called tails. So what happens is you don't turn it off whenever you think you've got all of this. You keep running it to make sure you get the efficiency and everything out of the raw ingredients you have so nothing goes to waste. So the heads and tails get redistilled in the wash still in the next batch. It's referred to as a charge. You increase the alcohol content, which means it boils a little bit quicker, saves on energy, gets it done a little bit sooner, 
uh, and nothing goes to waste. So that's the heart of the spirit, guys. Uh, we'll get to taste something very similar a little bit later on, uh, but essentially it's crystal clear, as you can tell. So whiskey doesn't come out brown, nor does any spirit. Distillation removes all color. Okay. So anything you buy that has a dark color to it uh, actually has a touch of wood. So hopefully that makes sense. Or you don't drink my food. It's basically moonshine. It is, essentially. Yeah. Moonshine would be a legal term. Uh, in a legitimate term, we call it new make spirit. Yeah. It is safe to drink, but it is sort of, uh, tastes like 60-80% alcohol content. Um, what people, most misconceptions are, higher the alcohol, more dangerous it is. It's not true. Uh, Highly alcohol just means more alcohol, less water. Okay? Um, some of the stuff that we play with, which I'll show you guys later on, it's 96%. You could drink it, but it just wouldn't be very nice. Cool? Yep. Um, guys, any questions about the actual whiskey sort of starting process here? Easy. Where does the grain come from? Uh, I can explain that a little bit later on. Yeah? So we'll come back around. We'll go full circle today, guys. Just hang tight here, guys. I'm going to show you something here. Uh -huh. <laughs> Alrighty. Cool, open cask. Uh, not open casket, sorry, open cask. So guys, this is a ex-bourbon barrel. On the inside, it is charred to a grade four. Um, this is a 100 litre cask. So the technical term of bourbon, a bourbon cask, needs to be 200 to 220 litres. So twice as big as this. Um, the word cask can be used of anything of this shape. Uh, so 100, 200, 300, 400, 800 if you want. You can use the term cask, but you can't use bourbon barrel unless it's 200 to 220, okay? So ex-bourbon, um, on the inside it's a grade 4 charring, there is 5 grades of charring, 1 to 5, 5 being the highest, 4 being medium to heavy, uh, and means when you burn the crap out of the inside and char it, it raises the texture of the wood and creates carbon. So any of the nastiness that we get from the distillation process gets filtered from the carbon itself. Now, as an example, I've got this one from Japan, um, this is a very light charring, it's probably like a grade 2, uh, and then this little line here, the dark side here, kind of shows where the actual new make spirit permeates into the wood and it picks up 100% of the colour from the wood itself. In Scotland they would argue in textbooks 60 to 70% of the flavour comes from the wood. Whether or not that's true or how you mark that, I'm not sure. But it's something that is said in textbooks as well. So in Australia we've got some funny laws. Um, in regards to grains, it's really important to know we're a very young brand and a very young company. We're also a very young industry. Bill Larkin started his distillery until 1992 in Tasmania. Uh, our last Scottish or well, whiskey distillery um, was in 1950 and it opened in the 1930s. Between the 1930s and 1830, there was no commercial whiskey distillery in Australia. There was the first whiskey distillery in, uh, in Tassie in 1782, two years before the first legally licensed Scottish distillery opened. So we'd been doing it for a period of time in Tassie quite strongly, but then uh, Governor John Hunter and the reigning governors after so that the grains that should be going in the marketplace aren't reaching it's very obvious that our colonies are distilling obnoxious spirits so they enacted the prohibition distillation act uh, in the 1829 which means no commercial distillers until the 1930s so in regards to laws we're quite relaxed so whiskey here is not like whiskey in scotland in the fact that we have very lightly regulated industry Firstly, in Scotland, there's probably like a, almost like a Bible of laws that you have to follow in production and what you bottle. In Australia, we've got a couple of laws. It must be matured for two years in wood. So it doesn't specify oak, like every other country would, like America or Scotland. It specifies woods. So for us, we could use red gum, mm -hmm. uh, which technically isn't an oak, um, and we could call it whiskey in our country. Mm -hmm. And it must be matured for two years. That is it. So two years and anything of wood like, uh, it doesn't say barrel or cask either, so it could be a wooden box and technically we could call it whiskey Ooh, in this box country. Whiskey. Yeah, box yeah. whiskey. Could, could be a coffin as well. Um, and technically you could call it whiskey. And it also says in legislation, 1901, must be of whiskey light character. So I don't know what that says about a couple of like generations ago. It says a lot, I think. But guys, in terms of grains, one of the things that I guess I want you guys to take away from uh, uh, this tour today is that in Scotland, for it to be a single malt whiskey, it is 100% malted barley from one distillery. Okay, so that's all that really means. However, you know, Archie Rose, we actually use six different types of malted barley. So you could argue that technically, by the term single malt, it doesn't sound like it's a single malt, but the single malt definition in the UK is one distillery, 100% malted barley. So we are one distillery, and we use six different types of malted barley. So technically speaking, it is a single malt whiskey by definition. But misconception would be, hey, the public isn't. 
right? Yeah. Um, so a couple of grains, and I'm going to show you a couple. Please bear in mind if you're gluten intolerant or a celiac, I totally avoid this part. I've got a few grains for you guys to taste, Ooh. Uh, if you are interested. Let's go for a little bit easier. So guys, first grain I'm going to pass around is a Victorian Pale Ale Barley. This has been malted uh, for a Pale Ale beer, which gives you a lot of flavour, but not a lot of sugar content and wouldn't yield a lot of alcohol. So guys, if you'd like to take one or two grains and have a little nibble, please bear in mind guys, as a big country on beers, our grains are designed for brewing and not distilling. Sorry, sir. So therefore, we wouldn't yield the uh, the sugar or alcohol content that most commercial distilleries would want to get. Oops, sorry. Uh, just take one or two. Any more gets stuck in the back of your throat. It's not very pleasant. Oh, well. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, that's a good stuff. Yeah, Anyone else in the back there, guys? Just yeah, some malted barley. Oh, lovely. <coughs> it's really good, actually. It's Victorian barley. So Joe White malting facility. Follow up, commercial malting. Uh, common grain for uh, pale ale beers. The next one I'm going to pass around, guys, actually comes from Scotland itself. It's got a uh, Highland peat. Mm. So if you drink peated whiskies or have had a, a smoky whiskey before, this is where that flavour comes from, guys. So Johnny Walker Black, Lafroig, Lagavulin, uh, anything from the where islands. Is from? This is um, from Simpsons Malting Facility in Scotland. It has a Highland peat. Oh, yeah. So a little bit smoky in flavour profile. Mm. Yeah, so if you ever get smoky flavours of whiskey, yeah. this is where it comes from. Oh wow. Mm. 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 Nice smokiness. Yeah. yeah. We, we, don't, we don't have a lot of peat in the soil in Australia, so how do you get around the peatiness of the Scottish... Uh, so, we do and we don't. Firstly, we need a mining license to get our, our peat. Uh, but in reality, if you had a bog or a swamp nearby, you would have peat regardless. Because it's just carbon, or sorry, it's organic material, it's decomposing. Um, it's mined generally a few meters down from glass level. And it's just the soil that hasn't fully processed into fossilization. It's black because the carbon doesn't escape. So it just stays dark, but any sort of swampy area or organic materials fall in, decomposes with a lot of water, you can find paint anyways. Uh, so there is some sort of uh, samples being done in Tasmania. Bill Lark has his own mining license, because he was a surveyor in his previous time, so he took it. So he gets local island peat, uh, and a fellow down there takes East Coast uh, Tasmanian peat as well. So it is possible, but not on commercial levels. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, guys, I'm going to pass this one. It's called brown uh, brown malt. So commonly used in brown ales or porters. Uh, it makes your beer brown as well by the colour. So it's been malted and then roasted. So for us at Archie Rose, as a young company, please bear in mind, anyone that has distillation uh, experience would have worked in the UK for a couple of years that are Australian background. But because we're a booming industry, it's hard to find skilled people in our field because we don't actually have a place to study legislation in Australia. You think it'd be the case, but please bear in mind, uh, 10 years ago, you only had two or three Aussie products in your bottle shops. You had Bundaberg Rum, uh, St. Agnes Brandy, and Chateau Tanunda Brandy as well. Uh, it was always my biggest, what was that? The Chunda from Down Under. The Chunda from Down Under, yeah. Uh, we've got a made from Tanunda here. You'd probably argue otherwise. Uh, but guys, so what I'd like to say is, as the industry grows, we'll find more people you know, to work in this industry. But please bear in mind, a lot of the equipment we use and the sciences that have been applied come from different food industries, mm. brewing industries, and also winemaking industries as well. Um, it's That makes Australia that's quite unique in terms mm. of our flavour. So guys, the old argument of Scotch whisky would have been all malted barley makes Scotch whisky. To be a Scotch whisky, it has to be made in Scotland. Mm. So technically speaking, we are making single malt whisky, but it is made in Australia. So technically, not Scotch whisky. Thank you. We're a small company. If you did, would you have to change how you label? That's a good good point. Depending on the country, I guess. There you go, guys. Yeah, fair enough. So, guys, in terms of exporting, please bear in mind we're a very small company, uh, and what we wanted to do was look after Australia first. And because we make eight different products, as you can tell, it's hard for us to educate people in the UK. Because please bear in mind, most of our conceptions of brands is that places like Tanqueray or Beefeater or Hendrix only make one spirit, which is gin. 
When we talk about whiskies like Talisker, Lagavulin, and Lafroy, they make one type of whiskey. But in Australia, because our business model is so young, there's no way that we could rest on our laurels and wait 30 years for whiskey to develop or our brand to develop. Please bear in mind, most single malt distilleries back in history were made to feed and keep people lick it in that local area. And they were quite commonly <laughs> owned by the lords of that area as well. So it was made for medicinal purposes to keep people happy. Um, they weren't trying to make it commercial. Um, so the stock buildup would have been quite natural as they grew their own grains next door. They would have malted their own grains next door, used local ingredients. So if you look at the, uh, I guess, Scotch whiskies, Highlands, Speysides, Lowlands, Campbelltowns and Islands, the regions meant a lot more because you were taking everything by horse and cart. 2019, um, I guess paying Sydney rent, Sydney wages, and everyone living in Sydney, I, you can't rest on your laurels and making whiskey, and six years later hoping to sell it. Um, we had to diversify our business. For the industry to survive in Australia, we have to make a fair few other products. The other thing for us was to consider, in Australia it's easy for us to educate people because the distillery is here, but in the UK we can't go, oops, sorry, we also have a gin, vodka, and whiskey as well, because the brand wouldn't be perceived in the same way. So we we'll look after Australia first, once our single malt whiskey is available next year, we'll go to the UK market and then mm. manage that as a different thing. Um, guys, that's the whiskey part. Any questions about that? Too easy. Gin and vodka, really simple. Whatever we do with whiskey is not done in the same fashion with gin and vodka. The raw ingredients that come in it is very simple. Uh, to make gin and vodka as we know it today, to be quite contemporary, um, quite bright and have a lot of flavour and quite clean, we actually buy in a thousand litre container of neutral spirit. And all that means is a thousand litre container comes from Nara from the Vanilla Ethanol plant, 96.6% ABV. If you ever drive down the south coast, three hours south, it's a really ugly, unromantic uh, refinery on the left hand side, huffing, huffing 24 hours a day. So um, it is what it is. Please bear in mind, this is a practice that's been studied since the late 1800s. Column distillation has been designed since 1830. So what we're doing is actually by no means any different to what was done 100 years ago. Okay? So we buy in what we consider as a blank canvas uh, at 96%. We add water, breaking it down to 30% from the same water source that we use up here. And at 30%, we use that tiny little pot still down the far end, and we redistill each botanical separately. So if you drink London Dry Gin, or if you've seen the side of a Bombay sapphire bottle, it has the 10 botanicals on the side. By traditional means, a London Dry should be a single shot method. So all those botanicals will be distilled at one time. And all that means is you take all 10, you put it in the pot still, add your neutral spirit, run the pot still, what comes out is your London Dry Gin. Now as a young company, we don't believe that's the best way possible. Uh, and for us to do with what we have, uh, we produce 12,000 litres of gin a month. So what we do is each botanical is distilled separately. So we might use 14 botanicals for our signature dry gin, which is this one here. Um, for our first recipe, we actually studied all 14 botanicals separately. So we consider for this particular botanical, is it the root, the stem, the leaf, the fruit? If it's the fruit, is it the peel, the pith, the pulp, the juice? You know, what is the best ingredient to actually distill? Sometimes it's a combination of two things. Sometimes it's distilling it in two different methods. However, all these things have to play in consideration because each part of this actual botanical will yield a different flavour, aroma, and a mouthfeel and finish. So not all parts of your coriander will give you a nice fresh coriander flavour. Okay? Uh, not all apples will give you a nice fresh apple. So if you look at the actual mechanics of that pot still, you got the fat base at the bottom, which allows us to put botanicals in the base to actually distill heavily with the alcohol down the base as it boils. Or you've got the weird sort of carter head, which is a vapor box, which allows you to infuse the vapor with softer botanicals. So with softer botanicals like river mint, which is the tea that we get brought in from New South Wales, if we were to put it in the base, it'd be as similar as overstewing uh, mint tea in a pot. It'd be quite murky and heavy, wouldn't have that light menthol flavor. So by putting it in the carter head and just having it distilled with that vapor, it comes up a lot lighter and a lot fresher as well. Things like Granny Smith apples, if you were to put it in the base, it would boil, go pretty yeah, like baked apple flavor, not a fresh crisp flavor. So we put it in the carter head as well. Okay. So to make our gins, it's quite simple. We distill all our botanicals and study them separately. It means we have more control over the flavor and aroma of that one botanical. When we are happy with that, we'll then blend it in these 6,000 litre containers. Does that make sense guys? Yeah. yeah. Cool, it's a very different method. It's very non-traditional. Uh, it means that for one of the gifts that you may be receiving today, and I don't know if you received it or not, and I may be breaking some 
sort of. <laughs> they didn't say I had to sign anything. So you guys are getting a gym today that we've made for Epson, uh, which means that we got to tailor make these actual botanicals for you guys. Um, on our website, really we were actually the first company in 2015 as a young company to turn around and be like, please bear in mind our founder at the time to create this was only 24. It was 26 by the time we opened this door. We were 26 when we opened the doors together and we had one person in his late 40s who was the sales and marketing manager. Our head distiller was 20. So on average, our company was about 24 uh, and we won all these awards for our original products. We have a 20 year old distiller, a director who was 26 and a bunch of bartenders that knew nothing um, yeah, so we've gone a long way and now we can afford professionals. So if you <laughs> are in marketing or sales and you're really good at it, we've done, we've paved the way and we can now afford professionals as well. So you can come here. arc was built by an amateur. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, we've got all the animals in this arc at the moment. Right. So currently guys, we started off with eight employees. Now there's 50 of us. Luckily, most of us are now a little bit older. Um, but yeah, the idea was to build things that were slightly different. Please bear in mind your spirits that we've always drank you never wondered about who actually makes it, who's the head distiller or master distiller, now's the time to ask, you know? Where it comes from, who's actually owning the companies, because you might find that most of your bottle shops are owned by two companies, mm -hmm. uh, which is really unfair. Um, so for us, it was the idea of changing the old spirits world. So in 2015, we launched this program of tailored spirits. You can actually tailor make your own vodka and gin on our website. You put your name as the person that created it, and a recipient's name as well, for $99. So pretty cool. Um, it's less about the marketing gimmick of uh, a packaging or the brand label, it's more about what you guys want, what, what you like to see in your gym and vodka as well. Do you print your own labels or do you buy those in? So, we get them designed and they're printed for us. Yes. Um, so so guys, do you use Epson technology to print the label? I couldn't tell you, but if you like to pitch that, if you're part of Epson, then please by all means. Um, so guys, I mean, that's the gin and vodka part, that's us as a brand in a very short period of time. Mm. Um, I could share a lot more, but it could take me a couple of hours. But what I want you to do is, if you are feeling thirsty, you like to drink with me, come grab a glass, mm. and we'll go through the tasting. So now, this is the opt-in, opt-out, guys. I'm gonna go through all eight products. It's totally up to you if you wanna taste all eight. I'm gonna start from the vodka, work my way through the gin into the whiskeys at the very back end. You get a glass each. Uh, we've got a little water if you want it for RSA reasons. It's up to you if you want any water. I'm gonna leave it here. If you don't wanna finish your spirit, guys, this is a distillery. So just pour your spirit on the floor. And be born with it. It'll be the first to spill, right? Yes. Yeah. So please bear in mind, guys, this is a distillery. We are not the bar. We don't have any mixers. We don't mix your spirits here. Mm -hmm. We consume it the way a distiller or bartender would consume it. So you appreciate it for what it is from the bottle. Yes. Uh, I'll do my best to educate you guys on how to do that. Uh, please bear in mind, some of us drink spirits of up to like 75% ABV here. So it won't kill you. It just means that you won't get sick for the next couple of days. Okay. So guys, I'd like to invite you, grab a glass, and we'll... Uh, just a quick it. question on the botanicals. Do you still use right. a fair amount of juniper berries? Yes. That's like well, some essential of them? component, yes. is it? Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch base with that a little bit more when we talk about the gins. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So guys, grab a glass, please. Don't be shy. If you don't have a glass, you're not going to be drinking. Uh, it's as simple as that. Okay. <laughs> so guys, the first one to start with, guys, is Archie's original vodka. So please bear in mind, if you're not a vodka person, you don't have to drink it, but I am offering it to you. This is a wheat-based vodka at 40%. It has a few botanicals to give it a mouthfeel and a finish. The reason behind that is because if we bottle that 96% alcohol content with a little bit of water, technically speaking, that is vodka, odorless and flavorless, okay? But at Archie Rose, we believe that we could use botanicals to influence the way it approaches your palate and change your perception of vodka neat out of the bottle. So guys, vodka going around if you're interested. So what are the botanicals? Uh, taste it first, we'll chat about it after. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, would you like to... Just a tiny bit. Yeah. Hey guys, vodka, vodka, vodka. <laughs> Cool guys, a few botanicals, on this particular bottle guys, you'll find notes of apple and mint will come through. So apple and mint, you think about Granny Smith apples, makes palate pucker up, you think about mint which gives you menthol, it helps this vodka carry across your palate. We use botanicals very differently to most distilleries. We actually look at those botanicals to see what they contribute to the actual gin or the vodka itself, uh, in terms of just the basic sense of what it is as an ingredient. So, what 
It really is. So guys, please bear in mind, for us to get our actual recipe, we'll take five distillers and I'll sit down over weeks to blend a recipe. Then it'll go to the actual bar. From the bar, we'll actually make it into a gin and tonic. If you really wanted to, but I'm not very informal. Um, so guys, what we do is we make the actual gin or vodkas into a, a drink, a beverage, and test it out of there. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we send it back. And just, it goes back and forth until we're ready. Guys, the next one, signature dry gin, 14, 14 botanicals, 42% gin. Um, you'll find that most of our gins sit a little bit higher in ABV. The higher the alcohol content, the more oils it technically has, and technically speaking, the more flavour it should come across. Highlights of uh, lemon myrtle, dorigo pepper leaf, and straight rib mint blood lime. So four native botanicals to give it a highlight. Please bear in mind, this was our first gin that we made to not be offensive to the international marketplace. In terms of Australian botanicals, please bear in mind, on our continent, our botanicals are so far-fetched in comparison to the rest of the world. It actually can come off, uh, our products can come off if they come from Australia, not gin to the rest of the world. Just because of what we have in Australia. Which products do you like, the lemon myrtle and things? Or? All the Aussie stuff. Okay. All the Aussie yeah. stuff essentially has not been seen for the rest yeah. of it. It's um, <laughs> far-fetched. So it just doesn't it's, it's alienating. Because yeah. like yeah. gums, eucalypts, they don't have these in other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, any form of that coming in means it stands out quite a lot. So even the smallest amount of Aussie botanicals can actually be alienating to the international marketplace. So, so how did you roll that back to make it palatable? I guess you should taste it and tell me. <laughs> okay. yeah. I, mean, I was um, going to like it either way. So guys, technically speaking, gin has to have juniper flavoured notes or predominant. Um, it doesn't say natural or artificial, it just says the botanicals of juniper must be prominent. So we are coming across this bridge where it is deviating uh, and we're not really here to say who's right or wrong, but the international marketplace will tell us otherwise. So guys, for straight spirits, you really just want one or two drops mm. of a tip of your tongue. Uh, anything more is going to be a little bit offensive. If you're not used to drinking straight Tiny spirits, bit. it will hurt. <laughs> if you drink whiskey, you can probably sip on this neat by itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, no low ABV. No low ABV here. Um, so guys, we're about the hard spirits. I don't think you'll see low ABV come from Archeros for many years to come. Um, yes. Yeah. So guys, 42% gin. Uh, lemon myrtle is quite pronounced, but if you use any more, obviously it'll be a big kick of lemon flavour. You've never seen lemon myrtle as a native ingredient. It is a native strain. Uh, Eucalypt, yeah. the leaf gives you five times more citrus than lemon peel itself. <laughs> uh, blood limes, dorigo pepper leaf. Blood limes give you a sherbet citrus. Uh, dorigo pepper leaf gives you a wipe of a spice on the back palate. And river mint gives you menthol once again. Cool? Happy? Mm, Fantastic. Punch it along, guys. 52.4%. Rose, elderflower, honey, and pear as a highlight. Ooh. Higher in juniper, softer in botanicals. will come off stronger in ABV. Now guys, this is called our distiller strength gin as opposed to navy strength. Um, I've got no hairs on my chest, which will prove you otherwise for anyone that doesn't want hairs on their chest. Uh, not everyone wants to have hairs on their chest. Rose, out of flower, honey and pear. Tiny bit, tiny bit. That's it. So guys, please bear in mind, Navy strength probably goes back to the stories of the Navy travelling with gin. Uh, we decided to call it the distiller strength because distillers never get in the limelight. For all these hundreds of years that we've drank alcohol, no one actually knows about the brewer or the distiller. Uh, so we call it the distiller strength instead. So guys, no recipe here at Arch Rose is made to be better than the next. Uh, it's up to the individuals and time of day. This is probably the industry favourite because of the high alcohol content, the softer botanicals. Honey is actually quite unique. Most places that use honey will only add honey to a spirit, being a raw sweetener, which will change and develop and mature in the bottle. But this is actually distilled honey from our rooftop. So, quite so you have, you've got bee, beehives up there? Yeah. Very nice. Tastes really good. Guys, how are we feeling there? Still okay? Yeah. Fantastic. 6.40, we're running on time. Mm. Guys, this is our Opera House gins. Um, strawberry gums and native uh, thymes and different types of citruses grown in Australia. Uh, anyone interested in these? Yes. yes. Cool. We're going to pass on the two new mates because we're running out of time. I'm probably going to do one or the other right now because guys, we're running out of time. 
So got inside and outside, okay? So what's the trade for you? Different uh, botanicals based on the influence of inside and outside of the actual house. Oh. So you, can, you can get one inside or outside? Inside, guys. please. Um, yeah, I really like the lemon myrtle, so we probably need to get that like better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside. Between inside and outside. Yeah. I'll try. I'll tell you guys after that. I just need you guys to take one of the yeah, other yeah. time. Inside. Well, outside's a little bit more uh, fresh citrus. Inside's a little bit more medium. Yeah. 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 Inside. Actually, inside. Inside. Uh, guys, inside is more yeah, yeah. bush Aussie. Outside yeah, is more uh, fresh citrus. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Inside. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good point. Actually, yeah. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting notes of seal. So guys, <laughs> inside gin, koala. Very well constructed. Uh, native thyme, native lemon myrtle, uh, and native well, lemon thyme as well. Uh, apricots and raspberries and strawberry gum. Okay, so very Aussie bush. Think about after dinner. Think about inside the actual. Uh, opera house being levers and beholders and woods. Um, concrete's quite textured, it's quite lovely. Uh, that's what it was supposed to invoke. <laughs> Did you have to pay some license fee to use the opera house? Uh, we collaborated with them, so they serve it down the opera house. So it's made exclusively for them. So, guys, outside June, uh, Australian grain yuzu fruit, grapefruits, three types of marine um, lettuces, so native sea blight, um, sea lettuce, and kombu. So, saltier, yeah. it's supposed to invoke yeah. the flavour profiles of being outside yeah. the opera house as well. Okay. Guys, last one I'm going to taste is actually our Archer Rose Rye Whiskey. Anyone interested in whiskey? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Guys, right, when you're ready, Sorry. last tasting. Uh, which of those martinis would you recommend? Uh, Gins recommend for a martini? Always. Always? Just <laughs> all of them? The more you, the less you mix, the better I think it is. I like my gins by itself. One drop of water. Yes, but uh, so I mean, yeah, very great each of the road. You, you, you salute in the direction of France. Thank you, uh, I sure. <laughs> I just drink it. Yeah, okay. I don't make it too complicated, my friend. Yep. Does they need to bend over and think of the Queen? All the French. As long as they might Guys, forty-six percent rye malt whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Is this available already? This one. Yes, it is. It is. Smells like whiskey? Guys, so for the last tasting, guys, 46% rye malt whiskey, virgin American oak cask. Uh, please bear in mind these oak casks are very unique. They air dry for 36 months outside before actually being coopered, which changes the chemical structure of the wood itself, meaning the oak comes through is a little bit lighter and more approachable than your usual bourbon or rye whiskey from the States, yeah. which use bourbon cask, the, the wood stays outside, or sorry, in a climate control warehouse for a month, and it gets cooped, so it's quite expressed. Uh, in terms of grains, 75% more to German rye, 25% Aussie pale barley. So in terms of the rye component, firstly, it's unusual because it's malted, um, which gives it a nice lighter spice, and a little bit sweeter flavor profile. In terms of notes, cloves, apples, lemon, a bit of spice, Quite easy going, uh, and it's a rye whiskey as opposed to a single malt. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Some question, this wasn't made with coffee. Sorry? Some question, this wasn't made with coffee. Made with? In a coffee. No, no, not at all. Um, so guys, I'll buy that, I, I as a thank you from us at Archie Rose, I know this is quite a quick tour because we're going to get the second group through. Um, if you do like any of our products, just because you're hanging out at Archie Rose and doing the tour, we give anyone a $10 discount. So if you like these gins that you tasted, you like the whiskey, you can pop down to the bar, just tell them you did a tour of Johnny, and the guys will give you a $10 discount tonight. Okay? If you want to take advantage of it, support a local by all means. Absolutely. Now guys, before you head off, if you ever wonder why Australia is so expensive for spirits, and, and as this industry grows, Please bear in mind the taxes we pay to produce in Australia is quite interesting. We pay the same taxes to produce as it is to import. So for every 700 mil bottle at 40% ABV, $23 in tax goes to the Australian government in excise tax. We have to pay the same to produce it on site here in Australia. So if you ever wonder why Aussie stuff is expensive, that's a starting point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure is. Um, have recently changed those like with the crop yeah. 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 Yeah.